Hello guys and welcome to the Los Blancos podcast. In today's episode, we will be discussing what the Messi deal means for La Liga, as well as we'll be discussing the Alaves game in full. Join us after this short interval. By the way, I'm just saying, I think you guys should go follow Real Madrid Committee if you haven't already. You post daily Real Madrid content, the most reliable, fastest news on Instagram. Go follow him. Link in the description. Right, let's get right into the video. Okay, in the first section of the podcast today, we will be discussing Lionel Messi's transfer out of Barcelona and to PSG, obviously, leaving on a free to PSG, Barcelona's greatest ever player, and possibly La Liga's greatest ever player as well. You know, so it's it's obviously gonna everyone's gonna take a hit and Unfortunately, you know, revenues brought by Cristiano and, Mes- and um, Lionel will not be matched by anyone else. It is, you know, to the levels of beyond compare. You know, we, we, we might be able to salvage it with a transfer of Kylian Mbappe, but it's never going to get to the level that Messi did because mainly, like, in the, in the early parts of the 2010s, Barcelona obviously had the campaign with UNICEF and that, that really started the support for Barcelona and Messi in, in Asia, in, in war stricken countries. And I think, you know, Messi, Messi's value and his valuation to La Liga is not going to be matched ever again. And I think, personally, ultimately, I don't like Messi. I don't like Messi for all he's done against Real Madrid. But ultimately, you can't... This is too big of a loss for La Liga and Barcelona. It, it, he contributed to like something like thirty percent of Barcelona's revenues, which is absolutely insane. And taking that hit for already, for, and how much they've already lost at Barcelona, is is going to be really bad. And for La for La Liga in total, you know, I can use the example here in in the UK as 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 a as a, as a driver. So a couple of years ago, when Ronaldo left. Um, Obviously, they um, La Liga's TV rights. They had a big deal with Sky Sports, which is the main um, company, TV company in in the UK. They had a big deal here, and basically that collapsed because Ronaldo left. And then ultimately, they went to a website called Eleven Sports that no one had ever heard of in the UK, and ultimately, no one went for it. And then a year later, it switched again to. Premier Sports, and then again it switched to La Liga TV. So it's been an absolute sh- shocker from the whole uh, from La Liga, and I think the revenue from the TV the TV money has gone down year after year, which has been catastrophic for a team team club Real Madrid and Barcelona. So like ultimately, Messi's departure is going to hurt us all. But do you think there is anything we can soften the blow with? Yeah, of course, you know, it's difficult, you know, to soften the blow, um, but, I mean, if it's one thing, I mean, we have to realize that Messi is in his 30s, I mean, at some point in fact, he would have retired, you know, um, and maybe um, it might have, to, it may have the same effect, you know, but how it happens so early in his career when he's on the top of his game, you know, and I think what, I think what makes this move um, a bit more difficult is the fact that Ronaldo left and Neymar left um, a few years ago. So that's going to make it a bit difficult to lose Messi now. Had Neymar still been in the league or had Ronaldo still been in the league, I mean, it would have been easier, you know, but because uh, Messi is, let's just say, the face of La Liga, he's there since he was a teen. Um, so I think he was the last superstar, you can say, in the league. You know, um, so I mean, yeah, I mean, it's difficult to soften the blow, you know. I think we have to go, I think the team, the league have to go back to step one, you know, like how the Bundesliga does it. I mean, how, how the I used to do it, or I used to do it before the signing of superstars. You know, I think um, if you look at the Bundesliga, I mean, they have such a great league, you know, um, they always uh, promote the league well, you know, despite the fact that um, they had any superstars. Yes, they had Lewandowski there, but... I mean, he isn't on the Messi level, on the Messi scale, you know. So, I mean, you have to um, look at other leagues, you know, as an example. You know, um, of course, you know, it's not like it's the end of the world because at some point in time, uh, Messi will have to end his career at some point in time. 
But the SC, like I said, is the timing of that, you know, you both lost to superstars um, in 2017 and 2018, you know, so losing Messi was a big deal. So, I mean, I just think they have to look at the overall program of the league, um, for the league, because sometimes, you know, it's all about the, you know, it's all about, you know, the top sides, the top three sides, you know, um, in the league, you know, so, I mean, losing Messi now, because he's part of that top three sides, it's a bit difficult. Yeah, I, I I really don't think La Liga know how to cope with this at this point. You know, they obviously had the Messi and Ronaldo hero, which lasted for so long. Previous to that, they had Ronaldinho and the Galacticos. And then previous to that, they had um, the World Champions League winners in Real Madrid and uh, the Dream Team in uh, Barcelona. So I just don't think it's been such a long time since La Liga have realistically had a had a, had no superstars, but at this point in time, it's a tough, it's a tough spot for La Liga. But I think we're gonna move on to it later about what it means for the Kylian Mbappe deal. But you know, ultimately, it, Kylian Mbappe is the only man that could come in, come into La Liga and save it. You know, if there is no one else who would be able to drive up the price, get the price up of the TV money. Of the of the revenue of the of the merchandise, no one else is going to do that apart from Kylian Mbappe and maybe Erling Haaland. Erling Haaland less so, but I th- I feel like ultimately, do you think that Real Madrid or Barcelona could end up for doing a campaign like Barcelona did with UNICEF to try and get the TV money back up, try and get the global support back up? I mean, of course, you know, um, that could be a, a good um, solution, you know, to get um, the money back up, etc. You know, um, I think um, I think you have to look at it, you know, um, in a certain way that, you know, I think it was, I mean, let me just place, let me just see this in a, in a different context here. Yeah. I think, you know, um, it was a different board of directors at the club, you know, in Barcelona previously. You know, I don't think that um, they can get a deal like that, you know, um, like in the terms of the current situation of the club, you know, unless, unless it's a proper, unless it's, unless it's a good formation of the, um, of the deal, etc. You know, but I think that's something that the team should look at, you know, to order to get them back the TV money, etc. You know, but it's a bit worrying for the league, you know, um, how how it's going at the moment, of course, you know, and especially with the new, with the new CBC deal that the league is selling as well. You know, um, of course, we we'll get to that later. You know, but I just think it's a bit difficult at the moment, you know, in terms of, um, because I think um, most of these businesses, I think they prefer to take their businesses elsewhere. Um, if you look at the context of it, honestly, there's a huge um, amount of money involved, you know, I think most of the, most of the foundations, you know, most of the businesses, um, sponsors, etc., they're going to take their money elsewhere. Do you think, do you think um, that they prefer to go to the Premier League um, or over Madrid? Over Spain, do you think that um, that's a big loss for us? Because, in your opinion, do you think that most of these places, most of these formations, would go to other leagues to promote? Yeah, I mean, obviously, Bayern Munich. Uh, we look at Bayern Munich quickly. They their business model it attracts uh, German German talent, German um, businesses because they sign German talent. They they sell domestic talent, and that's that that attracts uh, German businesses, and it's quite. It's quite a good model, and that's why they are probably the best well-off club in the pandemic. You know, apart from the Man Cities and the PSGs. So we look we we look to the Premier League, and obviously many of the Premier League sides have wealthy owners. You talk about Man City, well, the Sheikh Man, Sheikh Mansour, um, Chelsea, Roman Abramovich, um, Everton. The I forgot his name. The Everton said, "Oh no, he's rich. He's rich as well." So you've got all those all those um, owners who are going to attract a lot of TV deals because they're, they're going to be willing to invest. And ultimately, Real Madrid and Barcelona are owned by the members, the club members, and I just don't think that they can put they can't put money in the first of all. And I think they rely on TV money and business money. With no big star, they're not going to be bringing pulling that 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 money in with relative ease, you know. Ultimately, at this point in, in in time, Real Madrid and Barcelona are just names. They are not a big, big clubs anymore. At this moment in time, they're not the biggest clubs in the world, and we 
as Madrid fans, we have to accept that at this point. We are not the biggest clubs in the world anymore. We just big names, big reputations. We're always going to have that reputation. Real Madrid, Barcelona, and Man United. Those three, I think, are the clubs that are going to have the biggest reputation of all time. However, the reputation is not enough. The current ability of a club, you can see with Arsenal, you need that. You need a current ability of a club. And I think, ultimately, Real Madrid and Barcelona have lost that within the last couple of years because poor management, poor uh, the COVID, obviously. And um, obviously, that's just that's not going to help. But you need a good team. You need a good ability. And I think at this moment in time, they're not going to bring in any other, any sponsors, any big sponsors, any big TV deals, because ultimately everyone is struggling. And I, I think around in Barcelona have been hit the worst. And I just don't think sponsors want to be involved in that, that type of business. But we're going to move on to the PSG a messy thing. And I think... Ultimately, there have been uh, reports from uh, Andy Urabia, that's, I think is how you pronounce his name, that Mbappe wants to leave PSG this summer to be the star of a project. Now, obviously, this has come after the, their magnificent transfer window where they signed many, many fantastic players, PSG. And I think Mbappe wants to leave and he will leave this summer. I, I fully believe at this point... There's no other option for him. I don't think he'll stay one more summer because I just you, you could see with the photo he he wouldn't he he's not going to commit to PSG. He's not committing to PSG. If I felt if he if he wanted to renew, he would have renewed by now. So what is your stance? Would do you think Mbappe will be heading to Real Madrid this summer as a result as a result of Messi's transfer? I mean, it's a quite a difficult um, question to understand because we both know um, PSG's stance. PSG have been firm um, in their stance with Mbappe saying he's not going anywhere. You know, um, and of course, you know, um, Madrid have Madrid have going to sell Odegaard as well. They sold Milan, so I think that's the two crucial. Um, that's the two crucial series, you know, that can maybe push a little over the line um, for Madrid to offer more money to see it, You know, but most likely. Um, Maybe one week ago, I would say Mbappe is staying at PSG. Um, but now that I'm seeing that Madrina are selling Odegaard because they can afford to sell him now, they sold Verhan as well. So, I mean, that's close to 100 million pounds um, if you add both sales together, you know, in addition to a few other sales as well. You know, so I think that's going to be um, important to get the deal over the line. But the main issue is that PSG are going to demand maybe 150. You know, for Mbappe, I think they're going to be quite stubborn in their stance. They're not going to let him go because I think they know that with Mbappe, the team is stronger. Um, so that they can maybe say, you know what, if we can win the Champions League with Mbappe this year, you know, um, we don't mind losing him for nothing the following year. You know, so I think what they're going to do, they're going to put their eggs in one basket this year. You know, um, if you look at the signings they are making, you know, uh, Maybe they have one more year to have a more at his best. You know, Messi can still uh, Messi can still do it maybe for two to three more years at the top top level. You know, so I think uh, he's going to be better this year, of course. Neymar is at the uh, top of his game. So they are thinking, you know, what we have a We're going to try really hard this year to win the Champions League. You know, so it's difficult to see him leaving. But I think, you know, this week can change everything because Mbappe was booed by the PSG supporters on yesterday. You know, so I think, you know, maybe that can push him a bit, you know, um, that can push him a bit to leave. You know, um, let's see, what do you think? Do you think that can have an impact on the play? I mean, yeah, I mean, if the fans don't want him, then I don't think he'll be very happy in staying. I mean, he's, he he seems like he's forcing his way out, and I think that's good for Madrid ultimately. I think the the stance on Mbappe has changed a bit over the last few days. They've seen his his um his language and his his body language, and it, it feels like he doesn't. He's, there is no way he's going to renew. Um, a few days ago, uh, I mean yesterday, uh, there was a Twitter space from um, Qatari, who's a very very reliable source for for PSG news. He was the one who broke that Messi was coming to PSG. So, uh, you know, he's very reliable. And he said that 
PSG are willing to negotiate at this point and over only if Real Madrid start putting it in fair bids. We don't know what fair bid is to um, PSG at this moment in time, but I think their, their stance is changing and I feel like Real Madrid do have the money at this point. You know, they've made been making sales for for a few years, a few years now, and I think ultimately, I think it's time. You know, you have to go all out in for Mbappe. We saw in the performance yesterday, which we'll get on to late earlier, that we found it so easy to score goals, and I think if we add Mbappe to that. Then the you know we could be challenging. I'm not going to jinx it just yet. We could be challenging for for Champions Leagues. I feel I feel like the depth is not enough, but I think if that that starting eleven is good enough to rival some of Europe's best. I mean, I mean, I'm not going to say too much about the game yesterday in relation to the starting eleven, etc. Because I was quite happy with it. So. Uh... Let me just take on the Mbappe and how he, how he can benefit Madrid. I think Mbappe uh, makes his team better. And if there's an opportunity to make the team better, I think you should take it. The biggest deal that everyone is saying is that why are you going to spend upwards of $120 million, um, if you can sign him for nothing on next season? It's not like it's not like he's going to demand less wages um, this season. That next season, because he's moving on the free, he's going to still want the same amount of money. You know, so I mean, do you think that he would take the hit this season and be like, you know what, Bill is coming back with this year, is going to get better on Ancelotti, as well as Chico Hazard, um, maybe can get better as well. Um, do you think that he can take the hit this year? You know what, say, you know what, we can sign him up if nothing next year, and also he'll make out as well. You know, so do you think that's a better option? You know, I agree with you. For something for free is much better. I just feel like, you know, ultimately, we don't know when Benzema is going to diminish. And I think this has always been the problem. We don't know Benzema when Benzema is going to start start plummeting in ability and his pace and his strength. We don't know that yet. He's 34. It could happen at any time. So I'd rather have Impact in Haaland ready the ready there before that ultimately happens because if that happens this season and we don't have Mbappe, we are not going to have a good season no matter what happens. You know, Jovic is not good enough just yet to to step in for for Benzema if needed, and same with Mariano. Ultimately, Benzema is one one player that is irre- irreplaceable at Real Madrid, and I th- I think that you know. It's it's a risk if we don't if we don't sign him back here this summer. So if we don't sign him back here this summer, there is always the risk that that Benzema is going to diminish. But I think next summer, if 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 we get him on a free, it will cost less money. However, signing on fees, agents' fees, fair wages will all ultimately increase. And I think it's it's all just, financially it makes sense to go this summer rather than next summer, as well as in terms of Benzema. Yeah, of course, you know, that's a good point there. You know, I think the I think the good thing about it is that, you know, um, Mbappe is going to be like, you know, a better fresh air because yes we have a lot of players in that position. But we all know how much they are struggling, um well how much they struggled last season I should say. You know, so I mean Mbappe coming in, I mean the fans are going to want them, you know how we know, we know he's going to make the team better. You know, of course, um, players, more players may have to be shifted from the fit in because I think that's going to be 10 players in our forward line because um, there are only three spaces, you know, and I think if I'm back in terms, I think that's going to make it, you know, close to 10 players, you know, for three positions, 10 or 11 players. You know, so, I mean, that's a bit difficult to sort out and some players may have to leave. You know, but, I mean, if you're going to tell me, for example, Choose between Mbappe or Hazard. Choose between Mbappe and Vinicius, of course. Um, you have to choose Mbappe because he's a better player. Uh, he's, well, he's a way better player. Not that the others are bad, you know, but when you're building a squad, you build it on one of the best players. Um, for example, if, in, if for example, we sign Aham Haaland and Mbappe, that's going to be part of the front too. And you're going to say, not Vinicius and Hedrigo. Um, you're good players, but if you have to stay in the squad, 
you have to you have to you know um, you have to try to coexist with these players you know and what I'm seeing now is that um, what I'm seeing now is that um, is that you know the CS and Jigo and despite the fact that they've been actually you know it's difficult to see and you know starting you know um, for the club in the long term um, I think um, Vinicius, I think Flair, Flair, you know, has bigger hopes of him over Rodrigo. You know, um, you can see that he's one of the most untouchable players in the squad. So I think you have to tell them, you have to correct us with these new players because, of course, uh, Alan and Mbappe, Mbappe especially, is better. You know, so you have to um, ask that Vinicius and Rodrigo correct us. You know, they have to adapt their game now. Yep. Okay, I think that'll be it for this section of the podcast. Um, Join us after this short interval. Okay, yesterday night we obviously played uh, Alaves at the Melir Farrakha Stadium in uh, in uh, Basque, and yeah, it was a, it was a very very convincing and very very thorough performance from everyone. You know, on the pitch, you know, I, th- I thought the, the defense was good, the midfield was good at controlling the ball, driving the ball, which is quite quite um, impressive. They controlled the tempo of the match very well, and I thought the attackers were very clinical when they got their chance. So I would like to start with um, with let's start with Pedro Valverde. Now, obviously, I had my concerns in starting him um, before the match because I felt like he wasn't ready and I felt like as he was not as he wasn't starting for the was it for many of the preseason games and he missed both preseason games I felt like maybe they were conserving him maybe he had a, a, a bit of a worse injury than maybe he was told but no he looked really sharp and he looked really really positive and he kept on driving the ball up the up the pitch and I think for Benzema's second goal, his um his run, run up the pitch. I believe it was the second goal. His his drive, up the second pitch was world class, and he just knocked it back to Benzema. And he did make a bit of a meal of it, but he got the finish in the end, Benzema. So what do you what are your thoughts on Pedro Valverde's uh, performance? Yeah, of course. You know, um, at the start of the game, I was a bit shocked to see him starting. You know, um, as well as few other players, because I mean, Fedi and. Um, came back um, a, bit, a little bit later than usual, you know, so I was a bit shocked to see him starting, you know, and um, of course um, I was thinking, you know what, you know, uh, he needs to be fresh, you know, to have a first game of the season. I think he started a bit slowly, and he eventually grew into the game, but at the start of the game I was thinking, wow, we are missing Tony a bit, you know, um, because I think um, at the start, at the beginning of the game, you know, uh, we needed a play, you know, to slow down the tempo and up the tempo of the game, you know. I think Tony was good for that. But Fede, um eventually settled. He settled quickly. And of course, you know, um, of course, you know, um, he was, had, of course, his energy was amazing again on yesterday. Especially if we look at the Benzema goal. You know, of course, I would be quite, uh, if I was the coach of Alaves, I'd be so disappointed in my defenders that they allowed that to happen. You know, but it's a determined, um, it's a determined move from Fede, you know, for that enthusiasm. You know, to get to the byline and um, send that ball into Benzema. You know, but yeah, he started a bit slow in the first 10 minutes. Then I think he eventually settled. And I think he did well. I mean, I think I think that's a good midfield, you know, if you can have Fede and Casemiro in the middle. Um, alongside Montreal and Cruz, I think it can give you that dominance that you need, you know. Yeah, um, we, we, we're obviously going to miss Tony, obviously. I mean, it's, it's only natural that we're going to miss a player of his quality. So um, Tony's obviously missing for a few weeks with that with that injury, which is not very nice. Uh, you can't even train, so um, it's it's not a good injury to to have. So I think Fede he, he done a good job in deputising for Tony, and I think you know he brings something different to that Tony. Tony's not very mobile, obviously, but Fede you know he, he his recovery runs, his his pace is just is is just fantastic, and I think it's a breath of fresh air for this team. You know, it's something that this team doesn't really have, you know, that that player who just keeps running, just keeps running, just keeps running. And I think Fede, is, is, he's just a fantastic player for that. And I think he, he is an untouchable player. And I think the next 
10 years that that midfield, one of those midfield spots are locked down because that is Fede's position. Fede will be playing at that position regularly for the next 10 years. And I think it has to be this season because Tony announced that he will be leaving Real Madrid in 2023, I think he's. Yeah, I think that's when his contract expires, yes. Yeah, so I think that's what he's, that he, he said he, he'd most likely be leaving in 2023. So I think this season, uh, Fede has to really stamp his mark in the first team and I think Fede has to really win win that first team sport off of Tony. And I think if he can do that, then I think he'll be set for the next 10 years. Yeah, of course, you know, and of course, there are many other midfielders who we can sign, you know, when Luka Matrik eventually leaves, you know, so I mean, yeah, Fadi um, is the guy who can, you know, take this team forward along with Casemiro. I mean, of course, of course, at some point in time, we're going to have to face out Casemiro as well, but he's still performing at the top level, he still has energy, you know, to play in that centre of the midfield with Fadi as well, you know, um, so of course, you know, um, if you're looking at Fadi's game on yesterday, it's normal that he started a bit slow because, of course, uh, maybe he wasn't at 100%. And he was substituted late in the game. I think he should have been taken off early, earlier, you know, because you don't want to, um, you don't want to have him injured now, especially with Tony missing. You know, so I mean, yeah, of course, you know, I'm, I'm always happy when he plays, you know, because he brings so much energy and determination to the team on both sides of the ball, you know. Um, so I mean, yeah, of course, you know. Um, I mean, Freddie brings a lot to this team, you know, so, I mean, we should take it a bit slow with him, you know, um, if he's going to start, you know, if the game is finished, you know, you can take him out after 70 minutes, you know, so, I mean, yeah, that can be, that's a good deal for him, a good start of the season for Freddie as well, especially if Tony missing, we should be happy how he played. Yep. Okay, so, I think we'll move on to, should we do it now? Yeah, I think we should. Um, We're going to move on to... Eden Hazard. So obviously, I had my doubts coming into this game. I thought you've got to take it slow with Eden. You have to, you have to try and get him phased into that maybe the third match of this season. But he, he was thrown straight into the lineup, and let's be honest, he was fantastic today. You know, he he, he showed fat, but he showed the flashes of brilliance that he showed at Chelsea. He was absolutely sensational, and the Alaves defenders could not cope with him. He kept on running at them, which is something that you couldn't see in his in his previous um, previous seasons at Real Madrid. He was running at defenders. He was he was playing those mean balls to like Benzema. He obviously got that fantastic assist where he just flicked it onto Benzema. You, if you haven't seen it, you should go watch that. Um, yeah, he was absolutely fantastic. Fede, uh, not Fede, Eden. Uh, I think I think maybe we shouldn't start him so many times, but. After the game, he came out and said his ankle injuries are, are in the past now, which is good to hear, especially with him knowing that his um, his body is the best. I think so. one thing to of note is that he's been in the gym, which is something that he absolutely hates doing. You know, he's been in the gym, which which you haven't seen at like Chelsea and Lille, and even at Real Madrid, you, you couldn't see him being in the gym. And now he, he like, the Pintos, uh, Pintos and um, Carlo have, have um, convinced him to try and get his body strength back up at, in the gym. And I think he's determined and he's fit. If we can get 25 games out of Hazard, I'm convinced we can win the league. You know, we, we, can, we can talk about maybe uh, Joao Felix for Atleti, maybe if he can get these goals. But, you know, Real Madrid have the most ifs. If Gareth Bell can get this this many goals, this many assists, if um, Vinicius can uh, perform, if Rodrigo can perform, if Hazard can perform, all these ifs for Real Madrid. And I think Hazard, it, it's now or never for him. It, it, it's now or never. He's always spoken about wanting to go to Real Madrid. You know, I think now's the chance. He has to improve this season. This season, I, I fully believe if Eden can do it, then he's going to be he's going to be happy with his Real Madrid legacy. Yeah, of course, you know, um, let me add on that as well, you know, I'm going to touch on most of the wingers also, you know, but let me listen, let me start on Hazard as well, you know, um, of course, if he can perform, you're going to win the league. If he had performed last season, we'd have won the league because we fell short by just one point. Yeah, we were one bit that finishes tapping away from winning the league against Sevilla. Yeah, against Sevilla, yes, against Sevilla, you know, um, so yeah, um, I mean, there's one, just one extra bit of quality we need to win the league. I think like I, I posted that Atletico much it got stronger, you know, but it's not like 
they only sign out Rodrigo De Paul, you know, it's not like they're signing, you know, one They're rumored to be signing um, uh, Mateus Cunha from Hertha Billing, which would be a fantastic signing for them. You know what, it's not like, I mean, they sign those players, you know what, it's not like, um, it's not like they're better than the players that Madrid have, you know, let's be honest, you know, mm-hmm. that Madrid do have a stronger team, you know, so if Hazard can perform and Bale can perform and then this year San Diego gets better, maybe Asensio performs as well, we have a way better team than Atletico Madrid and of course Barcelona, of course, um, they will have more issues um, than us and Atletico combined, I should say, you know, so I mean, they're in a far worse position, so Hazard performance is so important, that's why I was so happy with the game yesterday. When he started and the lineup um, was announced, I was like, I can't believe they're doing this again because I think Zidane tried that last season, trying to have, have us at back really fast, you know, when he was when he wasn't ready in my opinion. And I said, I can't believe they're maybe making the same mistake, you know. But I mean, as I got, I mean, sixty. I think I'm not sure when he came off. I think it was sixty-two minutes under his belt. And he looks sharp, you know. Um, I think you know before. I think in the first season in Madrid, do you remember when um, before he got injured, there was maybe like three to five games where he was starting to build up speed and form, mm. you know, and he was playing so well, you know. I think that this was a reminder of that. Yes, he still has it, of course. He isn't um, as I had 2018, 2019, 2018, 2019, I should say, when he was at Chelsea. But of course, I think he's slowly building up his speed a bit. He's slowly building up his confidence, you know. So yeah, I mean, he's. I was a bit um, worried when I saw the starting eleven, you know, and when no goals um, at half time, you know, I was looking at the game and I said, you know what, and the team is playing well. I mean, a goal will come, you know, um, because um, Hazard, Hazard was jumping deep to make things happen. Bale was jumping deep to make things happen. So I, I think you know. You were seeing what the team was trying to do. It wasn't like it was a hopeless first half, of course, um, like Carlo Ancelotti said. Um, um, the second half, we played with more intensity, and that is true. You know, but I mean, um, you could have seen that what the team was trying to do, you know, as I dropped in deep. You know, he played well, you know, so I mean, of course, you know, his link can play with, of course, the midfielders and Alaba on that left as well, and of course, Benzema. You can see that the team had a connection, you know, so it was only a matter of time before the goal was scored, you know, so I mean, it was a good start for Hazard, I mean, yes, now that he has 16 minutes on his but I think we should keep taking our time with him as well, as like Bale, um, I mean, yeah, we have a lot of options on the wing, when this CS came on a little well, you know, um, on the left wing as well, you know, so I mean, it's not like there are any options, you know, so you yeah, can yeah okay um i think we should move on to the debutant i think we should move on to uh david Alaba, who had a fantastic debut um not to assist um and even got a goal at vinicius so it was um quite quite impressive debut for david Alaba. Not where we expected it, though. I mean, we expected Miguel Gutierrez to start, mainly because Marcelo had the injury, uh, and uh, Ferland Mendy keeps on having this niggling injury, which not many of us are sure about. But, you know, I, I thought he was going to start left centre-back, but, you know, he he started left-back, and he was absolutely fantastic. His recovery runs were, were, were like second to none, but he kept on... He just he was fantastic in dealing with um what's his name Edgar Mendes I think is his name on the right for Alaves. Yeah, Alaves um I think realistically Bayern Bayern fans portrayed a a picture that Alaba was was a mistake prone defender that is just not true at all we've seen in his preseason games as well as in in this first game that he's just utterly world class. You know, I don't understand what what's so bad about him. You know, he, he was just out. He's he's been out of this world. You know, there's two, there. I'm running out of superlatives to give to him. He's absolutely world class. You know, his crossing is just fantastic, and his his energy on the left back position, which is is something I need, we needed. It's an alternative that we can get with um, with his attacking ability. You know, obviously Mendy's defensive abilities cannot be. Cannot be counted out, but I think is it offensively? Mendy is just 
he's not world class. He, he's pretty average. Where now? Now you can see. Now you can see that Alaba is. He, he is absolutely world class offensively. You can see that his crossing ability, his dribbling ability, his first touches, his shooting, even his shooting, right? They are all fantastic. And I think Alaba is a breath of fresh air we needed at left back. You know, we haven't had a good offensive left back since Pride Marcelo, which is obviously not that long ago. But, you know, Alaba is a breath of fresh air that we needed. And I think he's, he, he provides so many options. And I think, you know, he is just world class, and I think he is one of the best players in the world at this moment in time. Yeah, of course, you know um, when the lineup came up, you know I saw Alaba starting at left back. Um, I, I wasn't, I wasn't that disappointed because um, most coaches um, make their first team of the season um, take over a bit of experience, you know. So I mean, I was that shocked to see me get left out at the starting level, you know. So I mean. Yeah, I mean, Alaba at left back, it was such an amazing performance, you know, um, Alaba, the, the good thing about Alaba is that, like you said, he's so good going forward, you know, because, um, like, since Marcelo in 2017, 2018, or 2016, 17, I should say, um, Alaba actually was so good going forward, and so good defensively, what he have, um, why he's our best left back at this time, and um, of course we signed him to play centre back, but he's our best left back, you can't come that out, you know, um, because Mendy, um, yes, he's good defensively, but he's an average player going forward, you know, um, like you said, you know, he's not that good going forward, of course he got better that last season, but I mean, he's not that good going forward, um, of course Marcel has, still has good abilities on the ball, and still has good technique, and put in cross into the box, you know, but I think he isn't that good in terms of um, going forward in terms of his tries and his energy, and of course I'm tracking back, you know, so having Alaba in this team, it's, um, like you said, it's so amazing to have, like, you know, one of the best backs, left backs in the world, maybe the best um, left back in the world, I think he played centre back for so long, um, for the past two years that when you're talking about the best left backs, no one seems to mention him because he's playing a centre back, you know, um, so, I mean, I think people tend to forget how good he is as a left-back. You know, what he does um, going forward with the ball. And I think if Nacho and Militao is fit, I think um, they should be our two centre-backs if you're not going to play Alaba at left-back. Because Alaba just contributes so much to our attacking, uh, to our attacking uh, tactics, our attacking, our attacking setup. You know, he is so good linking up with the others as well. And he supported the attack as well. I think he's going to enjoy um, going forward um, with this team, you know, as left back. You know, so I was a bit happy, you know, um, with how he played. Yes, we signed him to the centre back, but he's our best left back. And then there's an opportunity to use him as a left back, I think we should, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, that just provides us with a depth of options at left back, you know. Ultimately, I don't think we should rather use him at the centre back because. Ultimately, that means we'll, we'll be able to get some more game time about Miguel, uh, with Miguel. And I think, ultimately, Miguel, is, is, is he looks like a fantastic prospect. And uh, Castilla definitely know how to produce great left-backs and right-backs. We've seen that with Hakimi. Uh, we've seen that with um, Lucas Hernandez. We've seen that, not Lucas Hernandez, Teo Hernandez. Teo Hernandez. Um, I don't think, you know, Teo Hernandez um, didn't come from Castilla. Yeah, he came from Atletico Madrid. But Sergio Aguilar, of course, yeah. um, came out um, from Castilla. Um, but um, I think, yeah, I wanted to see Miguel play on yesterday. I think um, Militao had a, a bit of a shaky game, you know, um, on yesterday. Um, of course, um, he, wasn't, he wasn't that bad, you know, but of course, it wasn't his best game. You know, um, so I wanted to see a bit of Miguel as well, you know. Um, of course, you know, I was a bit disappointed, you know, that he was left on the bench for the entire game. You know, I wanted to see him play um, because, of course, against Alaves, you know, when we're dominating so much, we could have seen the best of Miguel, you know, but, I mean, you can't blame Carlo Ancelotti you know, for going with an experienced team. Most coaches do it, you know, on their first game. Even Thomas Tuchel, with all the young players, he had a chance. He played Marcus Alonso. He first game back, you know. He played Marcus Yeah, Alonso. he went for an experienced team. Yeah, he played Alonso and of course um hey. even Mason Mount didn't fit there in yeah. the first half. Paid off to be fair to um, him. Yeah, of course it did, you know, most coaches would um go for that experience players, you know. So I mean you can't blame the guy, you know, for um, not playing Miguel. Of course we'd love to see Miguel it's a long season. 
you know, and I hope that um, he makes the right choices, Carlo Ancelotti, you know. But I'll, I'll, I'll say like, um, of course, um, I'm going to stop here on that one as well. I'm going to see the next day he's going to discuss about before I move on. Yep, okay. So, um, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, move on to Vinicius then, yeah. I think we should move on to Vinicius. Um, obviously, it came up a lot a late cameo for Vinicius. Um, and he it popped up with a goal, which is quite quite nice to see. I mean, obviously, I've criticised him loads in the past for just not being productive enough. But it was good good to see that he he, he was productive today and he got, he got the goal even... Even even if it was a header and it was really he should have he should have scored it, but we know Vinicius and Vinicius should have scored many more goals and I think it's it's quite nice for his confidence and I think you know it, it, we've seen him in the, in preseason and I think he was quite convincing in preseason he showed it like he showed his uh, finishing ability although he didn't score any goals in preseason he he showed that he he kept on getting on target. Which is something we haven't seen met much this uh, the last season and the season before, but I think he he's been good in preseason, be good in the first match, and I think am I am I wrong in saying that maybe it could be the start of Vinicius getting better? I mean, it's 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 a risky thing to say, especially as I said it last year and the year before, but you know, maybe maybe. We could give it a go, but I think Vinicius has to be getting double g digits this season. If he's if if we want to see some real improvement in Vinicius, I think double digits in either goals and assists, I think would be good in silencing the haters. Yeah, of course, you know what I mean. There are so many people um, who don't watch uh, many Real Madrid games and look at the highlights and see him as from Vinicius and say, oh, he's rubbish, he's not good, you know, um, but they don't um, see the action. But um, getting that goal yesterday, I was so happy that he actually scored the goal. It was like, you know, strikers finish, you know, and then they had a, you know, of course, you know, um, it was not much movement, in, but I mean, he was positioned well, you know, to get that header in. You know, not just the goal as well, you know, he was so lively, you know. I think he had a better game than Hazard, in my opinion, you know, in terms of his speed. I think he got to the byline three times, and of course, he squared one in, and that's what Jigok nearly tapped in, you know. Um, so, I mean, yeah, he was amazing. He actually got to the byline and had, not to the byline, he actually ran with the ball um, from the half line, well, I think a little bit after the half line, had a chance to score, the keeper made a good save, you know, so, I mean, it was such a good performance um, from Vinicius. I think, you know, um, Hazard was good, but Vinicius is just faster. I think, um, do you think that because Vinicius went to the Copa America and he maybe had the opportunity to train and play alongside, you know, a guy like Neymar, you know, that it's made him a better player as well? Because, I mean, he made... I think he's making uh, the right decisions on the ball. I said that in uh, the last podcast that we had, you know, when Vinicius had the ball, he was making the right choices against AC Milan. Today he was making, of course, you know, he lost the ball maybe a couple of times, but that's normal for a winger who likes to travel. You know, I think, um, of course, you know, um, he was, I think maybe because he played at Neymar, he became a better player in terms of the decision making on the ball when he's dribbling, when to release the ball. Um, that um, Those things can have an impact on players. Uh, and when he said that maybe he's getting better, if this can be the start or something, I think he played under Sidan um, and on the last time for two seasons. Sidan is known for you know, um, improving players, improving young players. You know, um, he's more known for getting the best out of um, players at the, at that time that we have. You know, um, so of course, a Angela is coming in. I think that Vinicius can definitely take a step forward. He can definitely better his skills. You know. Um, I think Zidane was just there, you know, um, to you know, um, try and get the best out of his talent that he had, you know, so um, not to improve the play. You know, I think Carlo Ancelotti can do that. You know, so I'm happy to see how um, Vinicius does this season. Yes, he has to get 10 goals plus. He has to take a step forward, you know, but in terms of how he played yesterday, his decision making, it was amazing on yesterday as well. So that's a good sign for us. Yeah, I mean, Vinicius. I think he, he he needs to he needs to make the right decisions this season. As I said, he needs to get hit double digits in either goals or assists this season. I've I've a feeling if he just starts scoring goals, then I think 
everyone's gonna start saying, oh, but Vinicius, he, he's suddenly good. How did that happen? But we've always seen it. Vinicius is, is always, he's always been a fantastic player. You can see he's never had the end product. And I think, you know, maybe if he starts banging in the goals, he can start getting the appreciation he deserves. You know, I don't give him the appreciation he deserves, which, you know, I, I may be reluctant to give him, but he deserves it, to be honest. And I think, you know, I think realistically, Vinicius is it deserve is deserving of a starting place next next week. I, I still have my doubts about Hazard. I think, you know, let's not let's let's calm it down with Hazard. I think maybe give 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 a go to Vinicius, but I think you know next next week give a go to Vinicius, capitalize on his form, then let's see what happens, and then then let's see who's who who'll be down down Vinicius. Like I said, you know, Vinicius had a better game. Maybe because he came on 20 minutes ago and he was fresh against a tired defence, you know. Um, but of course, you know, um, he played well, you know, we have to capitalise. Because let's remember, Vinicius, um, of course, is a quote-unquote feature of the club. You know, um, of course, if I'm back his size, that can maybe affect, you know, his positioning and confidence. But if you tell me I'm um, five years, even the one in this squad, I'm going to say Vinicius over Hazard. And if you have a chance to start Vinicius over Hazard, I think he said because Vinicius is performing uh, much better. Um, yes, Hazard had a good game, and that's, uh, that's a sign of good confidence for him. But um, if you're going to tell me that, you know, um, um, it's better to play Vinicius um, in the second half because he has the energy, you know, to burn. You know, I mean, you can do that with Hazard as well. You can do that with Rodrigo as well. It's not like you don't have energy um, in terms of our attack and substitutes. So, I mean... If you tell me we're going to have a big game, it's, I think maybe because Carl Ancelotti is thinking, like I said, it's the first game he wants a bit of experience in the team, in the squad. You know, so I'm, I'm not going to fault him um, on the first game, like I said, with um, Miguel and Steele. Of course, when the CS is far more um, polished than Miguel, in my opinion. So, I mean, I, I wasn't shocked to see Hazard back in the team, you know. But do you think that because when the CS. Um, he spent the season with um, better players in Brazil in terms of his own position. You know, that maybe made him a better player. You didn't think that um, because um, he played alongside him and not maybe training in a few games he played together. That's going to have an impact on him in terms of his playing style as well. I mean, I have some doubts about that because mainly because Neymar just doesn't seem like a role model. He's not a role model. He's. He loves partying, and I just don't think that Neymar's that type of guy to be a mentor for a footballer. But I, I do think that maybe, like, I don't know, maybe in training, Vinicius was wowed by Neymar and he just copied him. But, but realistically, I, I don't think Neymar really rubbed off on, on Vinicius that much. You know, let's not forget Vinicius is a, is a regular in the Brazilian national team. So, you know, to suddenly just come up after one tournament and become a better player, I think it's too much of a coincidence. So I think I don't think it is Neymar rubbing off on him, but you know we never know. We'll, we'll never know that, and it, I wouldn't mind if we had our, own, our very own Neymar at our club. Yeah, of course. You know, whatever this is, I think we should be happy with how he came back. You know, and of course, I think he is obviously working on his finishing as well. So that's good. Um, but one point I want to add to that: um, Are you concerned now about um, Rodrigo because he had such a good season on the left wing? You know, um, then of course Hazard came back on the starting on the left wing. When he and Vinicius came on in the second half, it was Vinicius who went to the left wing. Do you think it's the same old, same old for Rodrigo, where he's just going to be shifted on to the right? Do you, what do you think about that? Um, listen, I, I think, you know, there, there are two different sides of Rodrigo. I think he, he, he's right footed, so that's good. But I mean, if he's on the left, you you want goals from him. If he's on the right, you're going to get superb crossing out of him. We've seen his crossing is is absolutely fantastic, and I think, you know, I don't mind having him on the right. To be honest, like you know, there was an improvement seeing him on the left, cutting in and taking shots off at goal. But I think, you know, personally, I I think I'd rather have the the like the Di Maria type player, where he's just like he loves just getting creativity out of them. You know, he's not the quickest. You know, he is pretty quick. He's just not like we're not talking Vinicius quick. You know he is pretty quick and he and he and he's just his crossing is fantastic. So I think ultimately Ro Rodrigo, he can't develop on the left because there's too many players. You know ultimately there is a pathway on the right. 
whether it's Gareth Bale not playing every game or Asensio being inconsistent, you know, there is a pathway on the right. On the left, it's it's very obvious that it's going to be either Hazard or you know, or Vinicius because they both are deserving of it. Of it. So, you know, ultimately, if if Rodrigo plays on the left and suddenly bangs in a hat trick, then unfortunately, I think that's, he has to play next week. Unfortunately what for Vinicius. Scored? He scored a hat trick when he played on the right hand side like, yeah. in the Spurs Champions League game. But um, I have a question for you. Um, I've been thinking about this for a while. You know, so let me ask you this question. You know, um, of course, um, you know, we spoke about Mbappe earlier. We spoke about how good Vinicius and Rodrigo can be on the left, how good Hazard played today. We also have been Asensio, Lucas Vasquez. You know, do you think that Real Madrid should be, you know, in a 4 4 2 formation? You know, so that way you can say, you know what, Vinicius can play, well, Vinicius or Rodrigo, anyone has a hat, can play in the left midfield position. Um, and then maybe have another left sided winger um, in the front with Benzema, just like with um, Cristiano. Did, you know, because, for example, if you play a 4 4 2, of course, I'm going to, um, you can have Vinicius and Rodrigo playing on the left hand side at their best. You know, Vinicius and Hazard, Rodrigo and Hazard, any combination. Is it possible? Because it's not like Vinicius and Rodrigo are lazy in terms of defending. They work so hard in defending. So do you think that you can trust them, you know, to play in a deeper position in a four four two, where you can have most of these, where you can have them playing, you know, um, on their preferred position? Of course, it's a bit deeper um, than usually, you know. But um, if you can have the right structure, do you think that that can work and that's best for the team moving forward? Especially that Mbappe is going to start um, in the fifth year when he comes. He can start alongside Benzema and Vinicius um, or Rodrigo can play a bit deeper and still be comfortable on the left wing. I mean, the problem with that is, like, I, I totally agree with your reasoning. Vinicius uh, uh, does put, like, a lot of defensive work right in. But I just don't think the midfield is my main concern. It's just, I, I, I think... You're not getting the best out of three midfielders, you know. Ultimately, if we have three fantastic, world-class midfielders, you can't drop one of them just because you want to play an extra extra striker or you want to pull the, the wings back one level. You know, ultimately, I think you have to play all three midfielders. Three midfielders, and, and you know, ultimately, I, I spoke about earlier in the, se- uh, when, in the season when we did our, our season lineups, our preferred 11. I talked about um, a... Um, a formation where where we play all of our midfielders in one in one go. In fact, that means Valverde, Cruz, um, Modric, and uh, Casemiro. You talked about a uh, four three uh, four two three one. So I think uh, you know we we both spoke about we need to play all our midfielders. I just don't think that we're getting the best out of that. And and I think Vinic we will be removing some of Vinicius's capabilities in playing him in the deeper role. You know, we want Vinicius to be pressing and up against the 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 the, the final of uh, the the defensive line. We want him pressing the opposition because that's what he's good at. So I think it removes that capability from Vinicius and I think that's why we won't go to a 4-4-2. If there obviously are injuries in the midfield which there definitely could be, you know, they, it's an old midfield. Then I think 4-4-2 is not the better or worst option, but I think for first choice, I think it shouldn't be a four four two, and I think it, it should be the classic four three three, like it like it always has been. But you know, the main problem is that is obviously the midfield. So I, I get where, where your reasoning, but I just don't see it envisaging it, it be happening. But I'm gonna ask you a question here, okay? So we've obviously got, when Furlong Mendy returns. And say Alaba gets shifted to left centre back, would you push the defensive line up really high, put the defensive line almost to the halfway line, and push the like the the forward line right against the defenders, a bit like Bayern Munich, knowing that the the defensive line can can cope with a long ball over the top because they've got Fallon Mendy and David Alaba to make the recovery runs. You know, um, but uh, and of course, to do that, you need to um, have many options, um, which we do. You know, um, of course, we have many options. You know, I think despite the age, Luka Modric and Tony Cruz have played with so much energy sometimes. You know, of course, Tony, less Tony because he's a bit more well, but he's so good in pressing. 
you know, as well as magic, you know. So I mean, that would be that would be good for us, you know, in terms of becoming a more high intensity team. You know, that's gonna help. I mean, that would have helped us a lot. I mean, against a team like Chelsea where we were dominated, um, because Chelsea was so much um, better than us in terms of intensity. So I mean, that's gonna be um, a, that's gonna be a good move. Us, in my opinion, you know, um, I think um, with all the intensity that um, that can bring, you know, um, we need players like that in the team. You know, so I think that would be um, a good deal for us. Alaba is also a good organizer as well, so I think um, that could be um, maybe a good thing that we should look at, in my opinion. Um, so, um, what? So, do you think that's good for us as well? I mean, yeah. But the, my main concern is that it could cause quite a lot of injuries, and we all remember what happened last season. And no need for me to, for me to get into too much detail about that but you know we've got so many good presses in Vinicius in uh, Benzema Benzema's very underrated Modric you know he he may not be the most relentless presser but he's he's a very smart presser he knows he knows when to go in on the other team we saw that against Atalanta where he just nicked the ball when he needed to and he just the defender didn't know he was coming you know we've also got Valverde who would be absolutely sensational you could just envisage that happening where Valverde is just absolutely world class and just pressing the opposition's midfield and just not letting them go. And you know, he could be our very own counter Casemiro relent he, he, you can see him being a relentless um presser as well, just just like just sticking on to the opposition team, just winning the ball and just being annoying. And you know, we we don't have too many of those people anymore. Naturally you can just see him making a, a great tactical foul. Militao is quick, he will make the run. I think the main concern is the right back maybe not good enough, but I think, you know, we see with Bayern, their right back's not very good. You know, Pavard, you know, compared to the rest of the team, Pavard... He's not an elite full back. Sorry? He's not an elite full back. Yeah, right. Pavard, he, he's not as good as the rest of the team, let's just say that. And um, I think Pavard, you know, you can see that with, with our right back, Lucas Vasquez is just fantastic at crossing and his work rate. Right? He'll just keep on working for the whole ninety minutes. That's what I love about him. Um, you know, you can you can just see him with um Carvajal, he'll just keep working for ninety minutes longer. And Audrey Zola may be a bit of a concern, but he did spend a little bit of time at Bayern Munich, the six month loan. <laughs> where he won a load of trophies. I mean, yes. Yeah. Let me just touch on the right back a bit because I am the Another SD for me, um, but the thing about um, the fullback position, I'd mentioned, if you could only look at how the teams play, um, Real Madrid on yesterday, and they did this a lot in this um, when Zidane was a coach as well, especially in 2017, 2016, well, 2016 to 2018, um, they did this a lot, you know, um, Madrid would normally play, focus the game on the left-hand side. You know, um, with Marcelo and um, the Tony Cruz, Isco, um, and even Bale would all morph, would all um, drift to that left, you know, overload the left hand side, you know, then switch it to the right hand side. You know, um, I saw a lot of that on yesterday. You know, if you look at the, um, if you look at the first goal, where most of the play was on the left hand side, even Bale sat it out on the right, was on the left hand side. You know, it left a lot of space for Lucas Vasquez um, on that other side. I think that's something that Mitchell have been doing in 2016. I think that's when it started. You know, it helped us out so much um, in terms of making spaces. You know, so I mean, um, I'm sure you saw it as well. You know, most of our team mm. would drift to the left hand side. Yeah. Even though he was playing right hand side. Has all drifted towards the centre as well, like a bit like Ronaldo. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so I mean, so I mean, and that leaves a lot of space, you know, for Lucas Vasquez, who's good in putting balls into the box, Carvajal as well, you know. So I mean, yeah, I mean, it's quite different because Hakimi, yes, his crossing isn't um, as good as these players, you know. So Hakimi is like someone who can drive and be um, intent and bring an intensity on the wing, you know. So I mean, our full backs, our right back, in my opinion, don't have to be the best because I mean, their job, in my opinion, what I think that um, which they're trying to do now. They have all these amazing players who can play on the left. I mean, they can focus their game on the left hand side, you know, and then switch it onto the other side. I'm um, just like they did um, previously. I think that's something that Carl Ancelotti you know, maybe was trying to work on, and it helped us get our first goal, you know, so that was amazing in my opinion. Yeah. Okay, so um, we'll just touch on the last player of today's video, and um, 
we're going to touch on, I don't think we need to touch on Karim Benzema, I'll just quickly just go through Karim, I mean he was just fantastic wasn't he, he scored two goals, you can't ask more of him, he was just a complete player, Carlo came out after the game saying Karim is a, more of a complete player than he was six years ago when when um, Carlo was still there, so yeah, no need to touch on Karim, but my last, the last player I'm going to go for is Nacho Fernandez. Now, obviously, in the in preseason, he got the red card against Rangers. But I think, you know, in replacing Ramos, you've got to get a guy who's, who just, who, who'll just annoy the, 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 other, the other opposition team. You'll just annoy them. And I think Nacho does a pretty good job in that, you know. We've got a few players in that, like Casemiro and Nacho are just a bit annoying to play against. And they're just a bit of a... They're just they're just not very nice. Yeah, they're they're just like they're just they're just not nice to play against. And I think you know he showed that he was just like you just do anything for the team. And I think we just love Nacho for that. Nacho is just he is the like, round personified. So, what do you think about Nacho's performance yesterday? It was like an addition to see who's going to be another spot at centre back when everyone is fit. You know, I think it was, um, of course, Metal and just joking, you know. Um, and that show was amazing um, as well, you know. Um, he was, I mean, Hoslo is such a good um, player in the air as well. I think um, I think he maybe was attempting, he's normally, he normally dominates La Liga's defences in terms of winning the ball in the air and all of that. Nacho was having none of it on yesterday. He was so good winning the balls in the air, you know, such an aggressive player. You know, you need um, those aggressive players, um, especially like you said, if you're replacing Sergio Ramos. Um, you know, so I mean, Nacho, um, his covering was good. He was, he was good at making tackles and distractions, you know. I think, like I said, you know, um, I think Nacho, um, if you look at last season, um, I always mention, you see, you know, in the 2017 season, Nacho played up against Lewandowski, um, both legs, and he played well, you know, in my opinion, you know, um, then he played against Atletico Madrid in the first leg and did well, you know, so I mean, I mean, I can trust Nacho to play a big game. Last season, um, I had my doubts about Militao last season. But last season, of course, yes, he still has, was in this game. And then he has to make last ditch, just last ditch tackles to save himself, which is not bad because we're under that as well. You know, so I think you can trust Nacho and Militao to play a big game at centre back and have on the left back. You know, but I mean, this is like all they say is depth in terms of the centre back position. I mean, of course, um, the label isn't interested yet, but most likely he might because I felt that I understood that just said with the team, I don't know why. Um, so I mean, um, so yeah, um, the label might be registered a bit later on, you know. So I'm thinking about it and I'm saying to myself, you know, um, I can just not check because he played a good game on yesterday against big, against big teams, he always plays well. I'm um, not at full back, I'm not going to trust him at right back against a big team where he's going to be playing for base against like a fast winger, you know. But I mean, on yesterday, he was good at center back. I think um, if you can tell me that, you know, um, that Nacho is going to be on centre back alongside me left out two years ago, I wouldn't be too happy about that, you know. Um, but I mean, it wasn't bad. Um, like I say, Nacho um, is developing, he's playing better. I think he's, I think he's getting so experienced um, that he's improving as a player as well, and he knows that he's important as well. So he knows he has to perform. You know, I think he wants to start. I think this is his opportunity. He wants to play for the you know, Real until the end of his career, you know. So he doesn't mind, you know. Um, he doesn't mind you know, extending by one year in the future. I think Nacho is going to develop as well into, you know, one of the Spain's um, leading centre backs in the next two years. Because I think, in my opinion, do you think that Nacho is better than um, Paul Torres? In my opinion, because if Nacho had been a young defender and he played the way he did last season, he'd have been included in the squad, in the Spanish squad, over Epic Garcia. In my opinion. I have nothing against Eric Garcia, but I was quite upset to see him in that one squad. You know, um, over Nacho, of course, you can understand because Sergio was injured, but over Nacho, I mean, come on, Nacho has been, has been way good for me since last, like, for two seasons now, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, it was quite shocking to see that. I mean, especially because of the fact that Pep Guardiola had fr frozen him out of the, the Man City squad, so 
you know, it's quite weird to see a guy who hasn't played football in such a long time. I think the last kick of rule he had before the Spain squad was the game against uh, Leicester, where he conceded five goals. I mean, it wasn't very, very convincing from him. But yeah, I mean, you could see at right back, they didn't play him a right back. So, you know, it was quite annoying, but there was nothing really to do about it. Yeah, I mean, but, I mean, in terms of, yeah, I understand that, but in terms of Nacho, you know, in terms of, um, yeah, if he's going to start for um, Madrid, I have no issue with that. I have no issue with Militao starting either, unless something goes, unless, you know, something just happens, you know, then I will change my stance, you know. I mean, I can trust Nacho and Militao to play well. They seem like they have a good connection, a good understanding of each other, you know, so, I mean, I can trust them to play, you know. Um, of course, like I always say, they seem that you know Nacho is amazing on this today and he plays good as a back as well. I mean of course you know seems like he's gonna take a step forward because a lot of times in the past you know there was issues with that um, how he would replace Switcher and also how he's replaced better hand in the squad. You know so I mean Yeah, okay. So I think he was probably probably stepping up I think it's uh, uh yeah I mean I totally agree with you there so yeah I mean he, he he is the perfect man to replace Sergio Ramos without if we don't get anyone else. So, I mean, there's not nothing for really for me to add. You've really just like completely you spot on there, really. Yeah, of course, you know. I mean, I think that's it for me in terms of Nacho. I think um, the team is well instructed. Like I always say, and I've been saying it for weeks. And you know what I'm going to say? It's the best options. You know, but I'm happy with the starting eleven and the bench, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. I think that's it for us to, uh, this week on the Los Blancos podcast. Um, join us next week uh, as we discuss the who are we play next. I'll have to look at through that time during the week. I'm actually just focusing on one game at a time, actually. I do apologise for that. Okay, so that's fine. Um, I'll see you a lot next yeah, week. Um, thanks for joining me, as always. And I'll see you guys. Yeah, of course. So happy to be here as well um, in the podcast. Yeah, uh, I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. Thank you.